Dear friends, welcome to Who is Who in the Bible. It is a family prayer with the Redemptories. Today, we are looking at a group of people in the time of Jesus, and they are Samaritans. In order to understand the depth of the parable of Good Samaritan and the encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman, we need to know the history of the Samaritans. And today, we are looking and reflecting upon these people, the Samaritans. Let us pause for prayer. Lord Jesus, the Samaritans who were hated and despised by Jews, but one of them becomes the hero of your parable. In our experience of rejection, help us to see your great love for us. In our trials and tribulations, let your hand lead us and protect us. Amen. Dear friends, <clears throat> Samaria, as a city in the Bible, was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. After Israel's fall, Samaria, as a region, was in the central area of what used to be the northern kingdom. During the time of Jesus, Samaria was located between Galilee to the north and Judea to the south. The Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. The race came about after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. Certain people from the nation of Israel stayed behind. These people intermarried with the Assyrians producing the Samaritans. They survived through the time of Jesus and even in limited numbers to the present day. The Bible mentions stories about Samar Samaritans and the hatred between Jews and Samaritans, features prominently in the Gospels. Because of their imperfect adherence to Judaism, and their partly pagan ancestry, the Samaritans were despised by ordinary Jews. Rather than contaminate themselves by passing through the Samaritan territory, Jews who were traveling from Judea to Galilee or vice versa would cross over the river Jordan, bypass Samaria by going through Transjordan and cross over the river again as they neared their destination, the Samaritan also gained hostility towards the Jews. To explain the origin of the Samaritans, we must go back to the days of the kings. After King Solomon ruled over the Israelites, God's people the unwise actions of his son Rehoboam brought about division in the Israel, the kingdom divided into two. It is an example of Israel's failure of leadership. When King Rehoboam finds himself in need of advice of a difficult matter, and what was the matter? Jeroboam and all of Israel asked him to lighten the burden of forced labor that his father, King Solomon, had laid on them. We see that in 2 Chronicles 8.8. 8. In return, they promised him, we will serve you. Rehoboam begins wisely by taking counsel from the elders of his kingdom who advise him to reduce the burden as the people ask. If you will be kind to these people 
and please them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Rehoboam apparently doesn't like this answer. So he asks his younger friend's opinion. They advise him to lord it over the people and boast. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with the scorpions. Rehoboam decided to heed his younger friend's advice, seemingly because he stalks his ego. He replies to Jeroboam and the people, as his young friend suggests, then appoints a new taskmaster over forced labor. The people respond by killing the new taskmaster and rebelling against Rehoboam, who never succeed in quelling the rebellion. Apparently, Rehoboam did not take the rebellion seriously until this happened. When his chief tax collector was murdered, he knew that the ten tribes were serious about their rebellion. Rehoboam came to Jerusalem. He assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel that he might restore the kingdom to himself. <clears throat> but the word of God came to Shehemiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. In the 10th century BC, led to the schism, the schism was the culmination of a theological and political differences in which the kingdom was split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, each with its own king. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people <coughs> go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice, made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods of Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt and is set up on the Bethel and the other he put in Dan, where others sought a temporal Messiah king shaped by scripture, both kingdoms developed into corruption and sin. Despite repeated warnings from prophets sent by God, thus God warned they would be overtaken by conquerors. The northern kingdom feared worse than the southern kingdom with a long line of wicked rulers. It didn't help that the temple where God's people were to worship was located in the southern kingdom. In 721 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. Many of the people of Israel were led off to Assyria as captives, 
but some remained in the land and intermarried with the foreigners planted there by the Assyrians. These half Jewish, half Gentile people became known as the Samaritans. In 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonian Empire. Once and for all, as the walls of Jerusalem was breached, the temple was destroyed and the city walls torn down. In the 5th century BC, Babylon had given way to the Persian Empire. Nehemiah, a Jew, couriered favor with the king and was able to return to Jerusalem to rebuild. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord, God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esherodin, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers, house of Israel, said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. <clears throat> However, the Samaritans remaining in the land opposed the rebuilding efforts and caused problems for Nehemiah and his fellow workers. This was the beginning of a long-lasting hatred between Jews and Samaritans. In the book of Ezra 4, 7 to 16, Samaritans wrote letter to then Persian Empire, it reads, to the king of Ataxaxis, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute, or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we receive support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records, and now that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times, for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rehum and the commander to Shimashai, the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the reminder beyond the river. Peace and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me. And I gave the command and a search <clears throat> has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings and rebellion and seduction have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river. And tax, tribute, and customs were paid to them. Now, 
give the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? Now, when the copy of the king attacked her sex, letter was read before Rahum, Shimashai, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus, the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Meanwhile, the Samaritans who had resisted paganism developed their own version of worship using only the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <clears throat> and rejecting all other books of the Old Testament. Tensions increased when the Samaritans built their own temple for worship on the Mount Gerizim and stated that their mountain was the dwelling place of the Lord, not the temple in Jerusalem. With that, any hope of reconciliation between the two peoples was lost. 128 BC, the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple and ravaged the territory. Around the time of Jesus' birth, a band of Samaritans profaned the temple in Jerusalem by scattering the bones of the dead people in the sanctuary on the day of Passover. This heinous act, according to the Jews, defiled the sanctuary, making it impossible to celebrate the most important feast of the year. By the first century, and most likely long before, both Jews and Samaritans, priests taught their people that it was sinful to have any contact with others. Jews were to avoid the impure land of the Samaritans, and Samaritans were not to speak to Jews. In addition, Samaritans and the Jews fed their mutual hatred with insult and injury. The fact that there was such dislike and hostility between Jews and Samaritans is what gives the use of the Samaritan in the parable of the Good Samaritans. Luke 10, 29-37 Such force. The Samaritan is the one who is able to rise above the bigotry and prejudices of centurions and show mercy and compassion for the injured Jew after the Jew's own countrymen pass him by. It was with those centuries of opposition and incidents behind their people that we can understand the surprise of the Samaritan woman when Jesus raises above the social and religious restrictions, not just of a man talking to a woman, but also of a Jew talking to a Samaritan. Jesus went out of his way to break down racial barriers in his day. The racism he confronted was between Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. There was even a racial rivalry among Jews evident by now Nathaniel, stereotyped Jesus. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He was based against Jesus before he even met him. Racism boils down to pride, the ugly self-deception that we are better than you. Remember, we all come from dirt. Plus, our bodies consist of about 60% water, which equals mud. St. Paul wrote, We have this treasure in jars of clay. 
second corinthians 4 7 it not the container but the contents that is so valuable to god we are all equal loved by him and in need of his grace hatred has no place in the heart of any christian god's view on race can be summarized in a simple song, Jesus loved the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. To be precious means valuable, dear, beloved, important, cherished, treasured, priceless. Jesus dealt with racism among his own disciples at first. James and John, on one occasion, were furious that a Samaritan village turned Christ away and wanted to call fire down from heaven to burn them up. But he rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. If we harbor hatred and want to hurt people, we have the wrong spirit. In those days, everyone didn't wait in the same way. After seeing true love molded by Christ, the disciples rad radically changed. Later, Peter and John returned to Samaria to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Instead of praying fiery judgment down on them, of course, then they prayed the fire of the Holy Spirit down to bless them. Once consumed with hate, John later become, became known as the apostle of love. We need a fresh baptism of love in the church and in society. Notice how broken, broken down the racial barriers. Jesus went to Samaria to save the woman at the well. Most Jews went around Samaria just to avoid those people. There was total segregation between them. But Jesus had a divine appointment with a broken woman who desperately needed him. The disciples were shocked that Jesus even spoke to her, yet he took the time to reveal his messiahship to her. As a result, a two-day revival broke out in Samaria. Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Samaritans were the bad guys to the Jews. But Jesus made one the hero of this story to show there is good in people we may not like. Notice the priest and the Levite did nothing to help the victim. Jesus redefined who is our neighbor, is not just the person on our same street, but any person of any race who is in need. Jesus went out of his way to include the Gentiles and break down racial barriers. After all, he wasn't just the king of the Jews. As the Samaritans testified, we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Everywhere he went, Jesus interacted with the poor, the outcast, whether he was healing lepers, eating with the tax collectors, or speaking to Samaritans, Jesus constantly demonstrated care for those the world had rejected and showed that he didn't care what the religious people thought of him. Jesus showed that the gospel is for everyone. 
He said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. However, the gospel brought hope to Samaria. Upon the death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, the believers went out into all the world, beginning the good news. <clears throat> Philip went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with Shirk's impure spirit came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was great joy in the city. Acts 8, 48. The history of Samaria reminds us that no matter who you are or where you come from, there is good news through Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you invite us to recognize the reverence, your divine image and likeness in our neighbor. Enable us to see the reality of racism, gender discrimination, and division based on caste and division based on religion, and free us to challenge and uproot it from our society, our world, and ourselves. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good night and God bless you.